Welcome to Liberty Church online. Uh, it's um, great to have you uh, with us and watching this, um, particularly if this is perhaps your first time uh, tuning into this. Maybe you've never um, done anything like this or been in a church before. Uh, maybe you're looking for some answers or for some comfort in this season when, well, then you're you're definitely in the right place. So uh, I'm glad that you're watching this. So maybe uh, grab yourself uh, a coffee and a croissant wherever you're watching this, and uh, then we can get started. Uh, and I wanted to begin today by just recommending a book. I'll try and do that every week over the coming, uh, coming weeks. And uh, it's this book, it's called Emblems of the Infinite King. Uh, which is, it's basically like a, a systematic theology. A systematic theology is a, a kind of a collection of doctrines and beliefs uh, that we believe as Christians. But it, this is written for children. And uh, Joe and I, uh, through this semi-lockdown with our kids at home over, over the last few weeks, we've been starting each day by just reading a page or two of this. Uh, and it's been really, really helpful and uh, it's probably not for, for preschool kids, so if your children are school age or up, then I'd highly recommend it. And it's the sort of book that you'll read it as an adult and you'll learn things and you'll be fed as well. It's a wonderful book, so I'd highly recommend getting hold of that. Uh, okay, what we've been doing in this season over the last few weeks is been, we've been working through the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the Apostles' Creed is a, an ancient statement of belief going all the way back to probably somewhere around the third century, uh, so about 1800 years, and it's a, uh, a, a succinct statement of what we believe as Christians. And we wanted to go through it in this season, uh, first of all, because um, with so much going on in the world around us, uh, we wanted to make sure we were keeping our eyes on Jesus, keeping him as the most important thing. And, uh, and also, secondly, that we can not only keep him as the priority in our lives, but uh, for many of us, you might have some opportunity, some time all of a sudden, to go deeper into God. Uh, and that's what we want to do in this season. Go deep into him and find our, our strength and our support and our security in him and him alone. And we uh, hope that this creed as a way of helping us read through the Bible will be really helpful for us in this season. Uh, and today we're going to be uh, moving on uh, and finishing off the kind of the first clause, the first sentence of the creed, which is, I believe in the Father, uh, in, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We're focusing in on that second bit of God being the maker, the creator of heaven and earth. So uh, if you are uh, at home, uh, if you want to grab a Bible, and I've got two passages for you to read today. If you want to read, first of all, from your Old Testament, if you want to turn to the book of Job, uh, and read uh, uh, verses 4 to 7 of chapter 38. So that's Job 38, verses 4 to 7. And then flip over to your New Testament and read uh, from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17, verses 24 to 26. So if you just take a moment, read those two passages, and then where you are at home with family or friends, pray. Uh, and then we can come back together. So you might want to press pause on your video now and do that. Okay, welcome back. All across the world today, um, governments are scrambling to combat this virus and to protect our people, to protect economies, to save lives, to save jobs, and whatever you think about political rulers, either here in the Netherlands or elsewhere, and the Bible says we should pray for those that God's put in uh, 
in, into power, into rulership over us. So we must pray for politicians. That's an important thing the Bible encourages us to do. But what we're seeing at the moment is in a world that seems as though it's gone into panic mode, that the, the limits to political power have been exposed. And it's scary, really, when we consider our vulnerability as humankind all across the globe, that things that we thought were strong and secure are no longer that way at all. That health services, economies, financial institutions, major businesses and companies all suddenly find themselves staring into the abyss. And that's scary for us to consider it. And it's even scarier perhaps when you consider your own personal vulnerability. Maybe some of you are having to walk through a season of maybe you've been made redundant from your job or that's a possibility or you're suddenly nervous about what's going to happen with your job, your, your mortgage, your health, uh, the health of your family, your friends. And it's a scary season. And we, all of us in different ways right now, we're having to face up to our own human vulnerabilities, our own human weaknesses. And I think it's particularly scary because we've believed that, that a better world is somehow within our grasp, that we somehow had the power to change the world as we saw fit, that politicians in particular, but many of us as well, have lived with a dream of a better world, uh, our hope of what we could make our societies and the cities and nations that we live in. And in many ways, what humanity has attempted to do is the same thing that humanity has attempted to do many, many times throughout the course of human history that we've put ourselves at the centre of the action, that right at the centre of the universe, we've put us and we've removed God to the margins of our lives and our societies, or even we've completely tried to remove him from the story altogether. We've erased him from the picture. And we've been trying to build, I guess what you could call a, a kingdom, but without the king, a wonderful kingdom of, of equal opportunities, of wonderful equality, of peace and prosperity, of wealth for everybody. We've been trying to make a better world, but we've removed God from the, from the equation. And I really think that this next part of this creed, that we believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth, it should come to us as a significant relief, a significant comfort. Because when we have begun to see that the better world that we've hoped for, or the better life for ourselves that we've hoped for, is somehow under threat and feels vulnerable, we're suddenly thrown back into reality, that the new reality has suddenly dawned when we realise that we're not in control, even of the smallest things, but definitely not of the biggest things. But what this, these words in this creed give us is a wonderful hope that God is in control. The great reformer, Martin Luther, when he was commenting on this creed and what he thought it meant, he said this, he said, I, I believe that this means that God has created me and all that exists, that he has given me and still sustains my body and soul, all my limbs and senses, my reason and all the faculties of my mind, together with food and clothing, house and home, family and property, that he provides me daily and abundantly with all the necessities of life. He protects me from all danger. He preserves me from all evil. And all this 
he does out of his pure, fatherly and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness on my part. For all of this, I'm bound to thank, praise, serve and obey him. See, the fact that God is a creator is not just an existential idea, a belief that we can think about and chew over and argue about, but it's something that will bring you a personal comfort for your soul. And I think that's what many of us are needing right now, is to know the comfort of God to know the wonderful comfort that not only did he make everything, but he's in control. He's sustaining everything. Everything that's happening around us is all under his plan and sovereignty. Now, some of you might have questions about this idea of God being a creator. And often the big questions that get asked are about the, the how and the when how did this happen and when did it happen? They're more scientific questions and they're not unimportant. But uh, for this talk, we're not going to focus on that so much, partly because those aren't, they don't appear to be the questions that the Bible tries to answer when it looks at this. The Bible is much more interested not on the how and the when, but the who and the why. And the who, the Bible is very clear that God is the creator of heaven and earth. It's not just a few words written in this creed, but all through the Bible, you can find verse after verse again and again that makes this statement that God is the creator. And the big question of why did God create heaven and earth, I think that passage we all read from John 17 begins to give us an answer it says there, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. You see, before creation, right back into the midst of eternity, there was the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, in perfect loving union. Before God made anything at all, there was a perfect, eternally existing love there. And this means for us that first of all, we've got to realise that, that love comes first or love came first. That creation isn't just an accident of science. Creation isn't even an accident of God. It was not that... Uh, God was just in his lab making some crazy chemical formula and made Scandinavia by mistake. That's not how creation happened. Creation's not the actions of some cosmic slave master who wanted to put all these minions on earth that he could, he could boss around. That creation is the act of a loving father. And this creation is... It's the spreading outward explosion of his love. This love that was contained within the Trinity. This love of the Father loving the Son before the foundation of the world. That love was so pure and divine and amazing that God decided to share it with us. To share it with this creation that he breathed into life with his word. And that means that creation, all of the heavens and the earth, the entire universe, has a goal in mind, a purpose in mind. Because if you read the creation account in the book of Genesis, right at the very start of your Bible, and you see how it's, uh, it's divided into days where God acts and creates, uh, he speaks and his word creates and breathes life into the world over each of those days. The main emphasis in the story is actually around day six. What happens on day six is, is us, is humanity is breathed into life. 
See, God desired to share his love with us. He made us to love us. He made all of creation to be the kind of the stage where that love would take place. He made us in his image to be like God so he could have relationship with us. So it means that we're not slaves or minions, but we're, we're sons and daughters of the living God. That he made us even with a, with a royal status in the garden. Adam and Eve were given dominion, authority over all of creation, over all the animals and plants, everything else that's happening there. They're kind of sent there almost as like the king and the queen of the garden. Let me turn to that book that I recommended at the start, because this uh, communicates this in a really helpful way. It says, God makes humanity differently than the way he makes the rest of creation, because he, make, he makes the rest of creation for humanity. It's like getting to the theater before the play begins. The stage is set and ready for the performance, but you didn't come to see the set design, you came to see the actors bring that stage to life. The set isn't the story. It exists to help tell the actor's story. And it is the same with God's design. The world is the stage he builds to tell the story about his relentless love for humanity. That is why the king makes the world first, then the man and the woman, and then he plants them in his perfect garden. Let me just read that one sentence again. The world is the stage he builds to tell the story about his relentless love for humanity. See, God created all of his creation so that he could pour out his love into the world and show his glory to the world. And he crafted it intimately and precisely, and he continues to do it. And he continues to sus sustain all things as well. It says in Colossians 1 that he holds all things together. That everything that's happening around you is under his sovereign care. That God has a remarkable attention to detail, not only when it comes to your life, but everything that's happening around you, everything that's happening in creation is all under his care, his fatherly loving care. Now, for some of you, that there may have... Uh, in everything I've just said, a, a massive elephant may have walked into the room because you might be thinking, well, if God created the world as an act of love and if it's all under his fatherly care and control, why is everything seeming so out of control? Why is this virus that no one can seem to contain, why is it causing such havoc to people's health and to the economy why why are we all so scared why is there so much chaos why isn't god doing anything about it so let me try and answer that question and there's four ways that we can come at this first of all we could say i don't know and that's often as christians that's a perfectly reasonable answer to say well i don't know why this is happening there are things that will happen in your life that won't make any sense. And sometimes in a, a day or a week, they make sense. Sometimes in a year or a decade, you think, oh, that's why God did that. It makes sense now. And there are other things that happen when I think we don't really get the answer until we're in heaven with Jesus for eternity. And then we'll understand. You see, because in this creed and in the word of God, the Bible, it teaches us that God is at the centre of the universe and not us. And where we've tried to put ourselves at the centre, we've missed the reality that actually God's at the centre of everything. And he's God and we're not. And if God was small enough that we could understand his ways, understand why things happen, why he does things, if we could perfectly understand all those things, God would be so 
small and puny that he wouldn't really be much of a God at all. Secondly, what we do know is that God, as we were talking about last week, if you watched the video, God is a perfect father. As it says in his creed, he's a father almighty and he's a perfect father. And whereas our actions and character are volatile, we change all the time. God's not like that. God doesn't act out of character. We do things that are out of character. We do things where we suddenly think afterwards, I don't know why I did that. Or someone might say, oh, that was so unlike you. Why did that happen? But God never acts like that. He always acts in perfect consistency with his character. So the God that you read about in the Old Testament is the same as the God we read about in the New Testament. The God we read about through right back to the beginning of human history is the same God that will be there at the end of human history. And his character hasn't changed. He'll continue to act in the same way. And the way he's acting in the world right now is perfectly consistent with his perfect love. Thirdly, we find that God, he always acts out of love for his children, for us, his people, his church. And that love can sometimes involve uh, a discipline or a, a, you could call it like a pruning. If you want a plant to flourish in your garden, sometimes you have to prune it so that it can burst back into life again. And maybe you're feeling like that at the moment, that your life, you feel the pinch of life, that you feel you're being pruned. Well, I would encourage you to embrace that. Maybe go and read John chapter 15, because that will help you to understand maybe what God's doing in your life at the moment. And fourthly, and I think most importantly, we have to consider how, how it was that God made the world and how he made us. Because as a loving father, right at the beginning of creation, he gives Adam and Eve some freedom, some choice. He's, he's, he's not just pushing them around and dictating their every move. And they use that freedom to try and place themselves at the centre of everything that's taking place. They try and usurp God. They try and push him aside and they try and grab the wisdom, the control for themselves. And we call that the fall, where sin and corruption and chaos enter the world. And in one respect, what's really happening is that's the first and greatest virus is released into the world. This rebellious infection, this rebellious disease through Adam and Eve courses right through all of humankind into us even. This rebellion virus has infected all of us. And now both us and even the all of creation that we live in is all affected by this same corruption. See, but because God made this world as this kind of stage to release his actors into, to then demonstrate his love toward them, in some sense that we can't quite understand, our humankind and creation are kind of all bound up together. And this sinful, rebellious corruption has not just affected us, but it's affected the world that we live in. Romans 8 tries to, to kind of spread some light into this when it talks about uh, both us and creation groaning with this sense of suffering and futility of life that we're walking through, that there's a groaning that we experience. And in seasons like this, you're probably experiencing that kind of deep 
groaning and why is this happening and everything feels out of sorts and out of place but there's a, a hope that we cling to. See, because perhaps the most important question is, well, what, what's God going to do about all of this? This coronavirus right now, this issue of this uh, rebellion virus, what is God going to do? And as so often we will, we will say, the, the answer really isn't what is God going to do, but what God has already done. That's where we find the answer. See, because God created the world out of his fatherly love and his willingness to share that love with us. And that plan hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. It says in Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've continued my faithfulness to you. God's love towards us is everlasting and his faithfulness continues. Everlasting love, everlasting continual faithfulness. See, God's love came first at the beginning of creation and God's love will come last at the end. And God's love has also been revealed in his son, in Jesus Christ. We see the wonderful fulfillment of that love. See, for believers in Jesus, this infection, this virus that we carry, this corruption, it doesn't lead to condemnation because Jesus has redeemed us. He's rescued us. And we may die, we may experience suffering. This virus, this coronavirus, may lead us in lots of different ways into suffering. But even death itself has lost its sting now because of what Jesus has done for us if you are a follower of him. See, just as all of creation awaits with hope the final fulfilment of God's plan, so we can wait full of hope, knowing that one day he will make all things new, that there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, that creation will find its full, complete healing, and we will too. And we get to wait as God's chosen sons and daughters. Let me read this passage from Ephesians. This is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus in chapter 1. He says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. You see there that in the same way that it talks about in John, that before the foundation of the world, there was this wonderful, eternal, powerful love between the Father and the Son that then Jesus came to share with us, that we might know that same love. That also God chose us before the foundation of the world. That's an amazing thing to get your head around, that before God threw the stars into space, before he mapped out Scandinavia, he made a decision to choose you, to choose you to be part of his family. Before he worked out even his glorious creation plan, he was working out a plan for your life, a wonderful salvation redemption plan for you. See, because humanity was made, was created to enjoy and experience this love that the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, this wonderful love in the Trinity, we were made to enjoy that, to experience that love. And yet sin and rebellion has pushed us away. But in Jesus Christ, we've now been drawn near again. 
that we've been drawn right into that center of this eternal existing love between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That we get to be known now as sons and daughters of the living God, of, as royalty in his kingdom, as co-heirs with Christ, with his love and grace poured out on us. And we get to know his provision now, his fatherly care and attention, not based on any merit or worthiness in us, but all completely dependent on his wonderful grace. So that means we wait, even through seasons of futility and suffering and viruses, we wait, knowing we have a father who loves us, even in our rebellion, a father who loves us and who cares for us deeply and powerfully. Let me pray. Father, I I thank you that you are an awesome, powerful, almighty creator. And that truth gives us great hope that you created the heavens and the earth as a loving father and a loving father who's chosen to share that love with us. That means we can trust you even in this season we can trust that you're a good father who has good plans for us and we also can look ahead with hope knowing that you've rescued us that we do have a wonderful hope in you now a wonderful secure hope because of the work of your son Jesus Christ I pray Holy Spirit even as we sit and watch this in houses and apartments right across Amsterdam, that we would know your love powerfully and tangibly, even right now. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.